Hey everyone, I'm really excited to bring you uh, an amazing um, person, a guest who actually was spoke at my last Keto Summit, uh, Nadia Padaguana. Welcome. Thank uh, you. She's a, a naturopathic doctor and she also works with Jason Fung, um, who specializes in a lot of things, uh, you know, working with the kidney, intermittent fasting. And so, welcome. I want to actually, br the reason I want to bring you on is that uh, you wrote a new book that I wanted to talk about. PCOS. Um, so I want to know what actually is PCOS. Let's just talk about that first. Thank you, Dr. Berg. It's an honor to be here again. Uh, we did a podcast for your summit, and then I had the pleasure of speaking at your summit about PCOS, and because that's usually what I speak about, although I do uh, see people with all kinds of different expressions of metabolic syndrome, but my little passion, my big passion is PCOS, so I would love to talk to you about that today. And so I wanted to thank you once again for inviting me to speak with you today and being at your summit. And I got to meet your lovely wife and being in your home. So thank you. Thank you again. For You're that. Welcome. So uh, what is PCOS? First and foremost, very important. Polycystic ovary syndrome. But Dr. Berg, you'd be surprised that probably a great majority of your listeners know what PCOS is, or at least have heard of it. So every time I do a talk, including at your summit, which was a huge audience, by the way, I asked all of those people, how many of you people have heard of PCOS? And almost, I, I would say at least 80%. And, and remember that a lot of the talks that we do to a, a lot of our audiences are, are medical professionals. That, that's not the case at the Keto Summit. So right. it's not just that medical professionals know of PCOS. Unfortunately, it's very common. It is the most common reproductive endocrine concern, hormonal concern of women in their reproductive years the most common, okay? It, uh, <laughs> statistics say between 80 to maybe 30% of all young women, so premenopausal women have PCOS, polycystic ovary syndrome. It might be more, it might be less. I don't know, to be totally honest, that the diagnostic criteria uh, is the best way to diagnose PCOS, but this is how it's being diagnosed. So basically, let's go through that. What are the three diagnostic criteria. So two out of the three and you're diagnosed with PCOS. Even though polycystic ovary syndrome is a uh, syndrome, it's a diagnosis of exclusion, okay? Meaning you have to rule out other underlying, other possible uh, conditions, right? So there's certain hormonal conditions that can mimic PCOS, but they're not PCOS. So doctors are trained because it's such a common condition to, well, they're supposed to be trained to rule out other conditions. And when it's not any of those, um, then if you have two out of these three expressions. So one is clinical expressions, not necessarily lab, uh, not, not necessarily lab, but clinical expressions of high male hormones. So we call those androgens or hyperandrogenemia. So high levels of male hormones in a woman, and a lot of us know what this looks like, severe acne, hirsutism, which is uh, facial and body hair growth, and then male pattern baldness um, in women, right? We're talking about women. And many, there's actually many others. You could, you could get a very deepening of the voice. You can get an enlarged, enlarged clitoris. I mean, this is, it gets worse and worse, the more of these free male hormones you have going through your body, right? Mm -hmm. So clinical expression of, of uh, high male hormones because the lab expressions are not the best because uh, hormones fluctuate throughout the day. So it's very hard to pinpoint, but the clinical expressions are very obvious. And I speak from experience when I was uh, in my 20s. Um, the second thing is abnormal or irregular period and or ovulation, right? Which is a big, a big concern. We'll talk a little bit about that. And then the third is uh, the presence of these cysts. That's why it's called polycystic ovary syndrome, the presence of multiple cysts on the ovaries on ultrasound. So when the doctor does an ultrasound or the technician does an ultrasound. So if you have two out of these three and you've ruled out other conditions, there's a list of conditions, um, then you're diagnosed with PCOS. Please note that nowhere here did we talk about obesity, so weight, mm -hmm is not a diagnostic criteria or, or some other related uh, conditions, okay? So that's what PCOS is. Very common, as I said, maybe eight to 30% of all women, maybe even more, that's a lot. That's huge, that is, <laughs> uh, huge. <laughs> that is crazy. 
very debilitating. Okay, so what do I mean by this? Imagine being 20 years old and a cute young girl uh, or young lady and having uh, facial hair and acne, right? Um, not, not to say all these other things, but there's a lot of that in itself can be devastating. I 20, I could say 15. There's obviously younger women with PCOS. You can get diagnosed with PCOS after, after puberty, although, although it's very difficult to diagnose PCOS in puberty because, or around puberty and adolescence, because a lot of these uh, expressions or symptoms are mimic natural puberty, right? So mm -hmm. it's difficult to diagnose, therefore uh, they're not getting treated uh, early enough probably, right? right? So it's common, it's debilitating, but it's very serious. And why is it very serious? Because it's associated with many uh, serious concerns. And this is what I hope to talk a little bit with you today. So as Dr. Fung uh, would say and does say in that book that you have there, um, if PCOS was just about a little acne and a few missed periods, then that wouldn't be so bad. I think it's pretty bad if even if that were it, but it's not. So maybe we can talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So um, there's there are many consequences of having this condition. Um, I would it's my guess. You tell me if I'm correct or not. But um, pregnancy, if you're pregnant, you're trying to get pregnant and you're not getting pregnant because that's one of the symptoms is you're, you're no longer fertile. Um, and then you're taking, um, so you have this condition and then now you're going to try to get pregnant artificially or whatever. I mean, what, what are the consequences? Well, maybe you should probably talk about um, what's really going on inside the body that's causing this first, just to Thank give you. people a foundation, yeah. yeah. So this is a great thing. So that's what the, our book is about, the PCOS plan. It's not a doom and gloom, and we're not here to tell you, okay, this is the worst thing ever, and 30% uh, of women have it. We're here to say that this is a possibly preventable and reversible condition. That's why we're here, right? That's why we're uh, so passionate about this, and why Dr. Fung, who's a kidney doctor, like you said, why is he writing about PCOS? The reason why he's writing about PCOS is because He's written the obesity code, he's written the diabetes code, he's written the complete diet to fasting. And now we know about PCOS and we know it's an insulin resistant condition. We know just like diabetes, just like obesity. It's not that diabetes causes PCOS, it's not that obesity causes PCOS. I was very thin. I weighed, I think, 97 pounds when I was diagnosed with PCOS. Wow. I was always very thin. I'm still very thin. Uh, and so when I talk about this, I find that this is very important. It is true that a lot of women with PCOS have obesity. A lot of women with PCOS as well, so it's like an added thing. And they have central obesity. In most cases, I did right away start to get the central obesity, even at a very thin. So meaning I had um, a, a higher percentage of body fat, even though I was thin, and I had fat around my organs, okay? Wow. Likely why I expressed so many of these things so quickly and so young. I developed diabetes right away. I developed hypertension right away. So it's associated to all of these conditions because it has the same underlying problem, which is high insulin, hyperinsulinemia, which leads to insulin resistance. Mm -hmm. And again, as Dr. Fung would say, I'm always going to quote him, mm -hmm. as he would say, if the problem is high insulin, then the solution is to lower insulin. And we know how to do that. And I remember saying this at your summit, where I said to, when I talked about PCOS, I said, how many of you know about PCOS? And everyone was like this. And I said, well, what if I told you, you all already know how to solve it? And they do because all of the, your audience knows uh, and follows your, your diet, your keto diet, the low carb diet with intermittent fasting. Cause I know you talk quite a bit about it. So all everybody listening to us already today knows how to help people with PCOS because a lot of people put up their hand and they don't have PCOS, but they have a daughter or a sister or a friend that has PCOS. I get messages all the time. I'm now getting messages, Dr. Berg, from friends whose daughters or stepdaughters have PCOS wow. already. I'm 42. Wow. Incredible. Mm -hmm. So, um, when you when you do research in the, the medical the uh, you know you type in PCOS on Google right the first two or three pages you're going to get the same old same old by just the same old narrative where they're talking about well there's one of the one of the characteristics of um, PCOS is uh, or associations is they have high insulin but they don't connect the cause to this the condition treatment. so yeah. their inability to locate cause and effect. Um, so it's really, I mean, insulin and insulin resistance. Um, for those of you that are 
maybe possibly new watching this, or let's say you're you're searching on the internet trying to find a solution. Um, High insulin is underneath a lot of problems. When you get it checked, they don't really check for high insulin going to the doctor. They'll check for high glucose. And that's uh, the high insulin is not going to show up um, through the, I mean, in other words, you'll have high insulin actually takes many, many years to raise the blood sugar. So it's kind of brewing in the oven, builds up. And then one day, oh, I'm a pre diabetic. Um, mm -hmm. So high insulin is one of the first things that actually occurs. And, uh, the way to understand this is just look at the opposite. Okay, what, what, um, what does the diabetic, what happens with diabetes? What happens uh, when you have, um, like with a diabetic, you want to actually lower insulin and then you'll correct it. So, you know, it, it just like when you really uh, understand what happens with insulin and how it affects men and women, then it's very, very obvious. But I think the relationship between Maybe you can explain this. Why do women have an increase of androgen when they have high insulin? What's that connection? I can explain that. Thank you very much. And I, I know that you like to keep things simple and so do I, so I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. But I did write a review. It's, it, and I'm so happy that you said when you look at the scientific literature, because I did write a review called for the Journal of Insulin Resistance. So it's a review, so it's very easy to read, uh, which I like. It was easy to write as well. But it's called The Contribution of Hyperinsulinemia to the Hyperandrogenism of Women with PCOS. So basically, how much does high insulin contribute to the high, the expression of high male hormones in women? That's what the title means, and that's what the... the so basically, what did we find? We found that the, in fact, scientific literature does connect the high insulin to the high male hormones. So it's there, they know it, but yet the treatment, which is what you were just saying a little while ago, the treatment doesn't focus on the root cause at all. So when, when, a, when a young woman or an older woman, uh, women of all ages, really, they show up to their doctor's office and they get diagnosed with PCOS, they're told it's common and they're often just told to go away. There's not much you can do about it. Or they are given a million medications for a million different expressions. So it's a symptomatic treatment, as we know, right, very well. They're treated for if, if they have acne like I did, they're either given the pill if they're young enough, or they're given an acne treatment, uh, another pill to treat acne. If they have diabetes, which I did, they're given diabetes medications. If they have hypertension, they're given hypertension medication. If they're trying to get pregnant, like we said, they're put on fertility drugs. And then if they have a little bit of depression and anxiety around this uh, condition, they're put on that as well. And I could go on and on and on. Yeah. Um, and then if they are uh, one of the many women to develop a cancer associated with this, like I did, I had thyroid cancer, then you, you got to go through that treatment and then a new drug that they have to take forever and ever, right? So the treatment, even though we have connected the dot, and I can explain to you what, what's going on. Basically, there are these cells in the ovaries called Becca cells that produce testosterone. So more in the in our ovaries, they're way in there in our bodies. They're, this is basically diabetes of the ovaries, as they call it. Our ovaries have all these insulin receptors, and it makes sense that they do. If you look at, and I'm not going to bore you, but if you look at all animals, all animals have um, insulin receptors in the ovaries. It's a way for the body to know inside if there's enough nutrition out there for for us to make babies, I guess. It's a good sort of conversation with the outside world, right? The ovaries doesn't have eyes and it's a way for the body to know if, it, if there's enough nutrients to make babies. So there are a lot of insulin receptors in the ovaries. When you have too much insulin, it overproduces testosterone. And you don't want that. Uh, you, you, and then insulin also has a major effect on our liver, and we all know this. But one of the things that it does in the liver is it reduces the production of another molecule called uh, sex hormone binding uh, globulin, which is, which is a molecule that binds is sex hormones. So then again, to testosterone. So it's a twofold thing. Not only are you overproducing testosterone in the ovaries, but you're underproducing the molecule that's going to bind to the testosterone and make it inactive. So now you have more testosterone roaming around, but you have more active and free testosterone to go around and do what you don't want it to do all over your body. So you don't want it to go to your skin and your hair and express itself as uh, as it does in women, right? It, the male hormone expressing itself in women. 
And all of this is because of the insulin. This is in the literature. So if you want to have a look at that, if you like reading this kind of stuff, it's a review for the Journal of Insulin Resistance. Wow. It's there, but the treatment doesn't focus on lowering insulin. It is devastating for a woman to actually have to lose their hair, the facial hair, the acne. The, I mean, it's just it's this terrible thing when it's so easy. So when you understand the the cause and effect relationship. Um, now, as far as things that someone can do to lower insulin, uh, we know lowering the carb, low carb diet will do it. What are some other things that people can do? Basically, and this is important, right? This is why we're spending so much time talking about insulin because most people are like, oh, I don't want to hear about that. I just want to hear the solution. It's important that you understand the root cause. You, it's important yeah. that you understand that we're trying to lower insulin and that insulin is what's causing all of these things and, and, and including the obesity that might be associated with it, the central obesity like we talked about it, the diabetes and the infertility and, and possibly the cancers and everything else that seems to come dementia, Alzheimer's. I mean, I could go on and on, and I know you talk about all these things. So how do you lower insulin? You lower insulin in one of two ways. You eat less often because every time you eat, no matter what you eat, you're going to produce insulin. It's important that we drive this uh, point home. PCOS women do not eat more. So the eat less, move more, old calorie in, calorie out theory is not going to work. And this is what's so frustrating because most women are still being told at their doctor's office, you have to, you're overweight, you have PCOS, you want to get pregnant or you want to whatever, eat less, move more. They're not lazy and they're not eating too much. They're eating too often and they're eating too many carbs. PCOS women have a lot of cravings. They like carby foods because their insulin is high. And the higher your insulin, this is physiological. There's nothing wrong with up here. Um, I speak from experience. My entire life until I was in my 30s, I never ate a vegetable and I never ate a piece of meat. I didn't like it. I didn't want it. All I wanted was, I have to charge my, <laughs> before we shut off. There we go. All I wanted ever was carbs. It was fruit, bread, pastas, rice, and any junk I could get my hands on. Lots of sodas, lots of milk, lots of, it was just carbon, 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 carb. And I ate all the time. Why? And I see this in PCOS women all the time because I had rebound hypoglycemia. And because I was thin, there was always the impression that, well, she doesn't eat enough or she doesn't, she needs more sugar. And I thought that too. And because I kept staying thin, I didn't realize that all of that was going into my organs. I just couldn't see it on the outside. So PCOS women eat more often and they graze a lot. They crave a lot. So here's the concern that I have. So two things, two ways to lower insulin, eat less often and eat foods that are gonna create less of an insulin response. So higher healthy fats, appropriate amounts of protein, and lower carbs. So the ketogenic diet is perfect. It was perfect for me. That's the diet that I followed in my in my journey. Okay. Uh, Here's my concern. PCOS women are smart too. So what are they going to do? They're going to try to find substitutes. I can't have sugar. I can't have bread. I can't whatever, but because they're, they're still craving. The insulin is still high when they start their journey. Even if up here they're ready to go and they have the information, they're going to look for the substitutes. They're going to look for the sweeteners. They're going to look for the low carb breads and everything else, which is going to be an issue because all of these things are going to raise your insulin. You have to figure out how to eat in time restricted eating windows. You have to eat meals that satiate you and you walk away. You need clean periods between meals. This is the most important thing in my opinion. So it's a combination of an appropriate low carb diet with appropriate intermittent fasting periods. Yeah. I think the, the secret to this whole thing is that, um, just to let people know, when you do this, your hunger and your cravings go away. To, that makes it easy to do it. You're not going to be struggling. You're not going to be like yes. starving all the time. Not at all. You'll be totally satisfied because for once you'll be able to burn your own fat, which is a whole new concept. Yes. Wow. So um, this one thing that's uh, I like about this book here, and I'm going to put a link down below. Um, I'm not even sure if it's available yet for people, but I'm sure it will be soon. But um, it's available for pre-order and it comes out April 14th of 2020. Okay, cool. Well, I'm glad I have the, one of the first copies. Um, you have, yeah. you know what I like? Uh, you have a lot of diagrams and, uh, you know, 
I buy a lot of books and if there's no uh, pictures, I'm like, okay, I'll put that down. I, I need something with the images. You have a lot of diagrams, helps people understand quickly and uh, you can really visualize it. Uh, so well done. And I know how hard it is to write a book. Mm. So, um, <laughs> it's blood, sweat and tears. You know, you're in the, over the computer for, for weeks and months and uh, yeah, so well done. I don't know how you, had time to do that. <laughs> well, uh, I wrote the book with Jason Fung. <laughs> Jason Fung is an experienced author and he's very, uh, he's got very high standards. So I have to tell you that it was an, uh, a challenge and an experience that I highly uh, appreciate. Uh, now right. That <laughs> right, exactly. I'm, you're happy that it's done and it's completed and I could imagine. But he, you know, in, in the end, he just wants a good quality book. He wants he doesn't want, uh, you know, just a uh, whatever. It has to be perfect, and everything has to be perfect. Has to fit in, and and so I'm very lucky to have my first book, maybe uh, my only book ever. Who knows? I have no plan on writing another one anytime soon. Okay. But my first book with Jason Fung. So I appreciate it, and I want to tell you that you actually have, you you. I think you might be one, if not the first. I don't have a copy. I don't have a physical copy. I wow. have not seen one. You're wow. yours is the very that I, I am seen. excited. I'm excited. This is it because it says an advanced copy, and it uh, is? yeah, and this I, is uh, um, yeah. I, I, I think I have the only one actually. I'm in Portugal, right? I'm in Europe, and you're and and I was asked who I wanted to send a copy to, and as you know, I reached out to you right away. So you yours is the very first one that I have seen, wow. believe it or not. Wow, this is great. I'm gonna save this. Uh, as time goes on, it's gonna be worth a lot more, but I'm gonna keep yeah. it. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I want to thank you for coming on and sharing. This is going to help a lot of women that are struggling through this. Just realize um, this is not uh, difficult to solve if you have the true information. It's right in here. It's, there's, there's a lot of books out there that talk about PCOS and they explain all the characteristics, but they don't tell you what to do. They have no yeah. solution. So this is like, you know what? There is something that can work for you. Yeah, I know. As I said earlier, I started off pretty doom and gloom. But our book is all about uh, exactly that. What's the problem? Then here's the solution. It is a practical guide. It has a lot of good information, a lot of good science there that people just can't refute, uh, I hope. And as I said, if you go into the scientific literature, it's there. Before we wrote the book, I did the review. The review uh, supported the writing of this book, really. And so then there's a real good practical, well, I'm very proud of it, I, practical guide, because it has recipes, it has shopping lists, it has all kinds of stuff. So you probably haven't gotten to that yet. It's at the I did, very I end. Did, I did see that. And I was like, wow, they have, boy, you guys just went all out and just put everything in here. This is awesome. We I'm really did because there isn't, it, it, I don't know that there, you know, at least in my research for, for my, years, uh, really, there really isn't anything mm -hmm. out there like this specifically, even though a lot of People speak about PCOS yeah. in their lectures. I find a lot of doctors talk about insulin resistance whenever they have diagrams, insulin, re insulin resistance in the middle, and they have little bubbles going out. There's the diabetes, obesity. PCOS is always there. Fatty liver, sleep apnea, mm -hmm. it's always there. But uh, I don't know. I, I guess I, I lived it. Right. I know what this is like. I had two children thanks to reversing PCOS. Wow. We didn't even get to talk about what happens if you get pregnant with PCOS and you don't reverse oh, it. We need to talk, we need to talk about that. Okay. <laughs> okay. We can do that. <laughs> yeah. It's very important. And, and I will have to do another one of these just on um, pregnancy because, oh my gosh, this is like, that's the most important uh, time to um, make sure your health and your diet is correct because that predicts the future of that child's health it really does and you you better know what you're doing um or you're going to be struggling with all sorts of issues and so the, the child so um we we uh, my daughter-in-law lives with us um and so um she we made sure her diet was really really clean so this child lucy came out like a super baby uh i mean just incredibly healthy um yeah she does get sick occasionally but she's building up her immune system she pops out of it like that um, but talk about a healthy child. So uh, I'm going to be doing more videos on that. But I want to thank you for your time. And uh, I think a lot of people are going to be helped. I'll put the link down below. Um, and it's the PCOS plan. Awesome. That's it. Thank you so much. You're welcome.